Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. We'll continue to work with universities to hold them accountable as well as help them figure this out. Another casualty of LSU sexual misconduct report. That's pretty staggering numbers. Louisiana now home to the robocall capital of the nation. Why would we wait until we have a crisis to talk about this? Groundwater aquifers in danger. Anti-Asian racism has always been ex in existence all throughout American history. Louisiana activists react to the spa shootings in Atlanta. Hello, everybody. I'm Kara Sinks here. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, Monday in Louisiana, the COVID vaccination will be available to anyone 16 and older who wants it. Louisiana becomes one of only nine states to offer to anyone. No pre-existing health conditions or work status involved. But keep in mind, teenagers 16 to 17 are only approved for the Pfizer vaccine. Now this, as the state death toll went over 10,000 this week, setting that milestone. And in their weekly press briefing, Dr. Joseph Cantor said, getting the vaccine is only half the battle. The rest is encouraging your neighbors to do the same. I can tell you right now, 23.5% of the state's population has at least initiated a vaccine series. 13.8% has completed that series and we can do better than that. So if you've already done it yourself, Thank you. Go get your friends and family covered. And now to other news making headlines across the state. The State Board of Regents vows to put its foot down on state schools. They will send college board leaders questions to find out how they would handle misconduct claims. They want answers by April 9th. The Regents' review is based on the independent report on LSU, which found failures for years in the handling of allegations of rape, domestic violence, and assault. State senators opened their latest budget hearings Monday with big concerns. It's over the use of short-term federal coronavirus aid to pay for ongoing services and programs because the federal cash will disappear in later years. The governor's chief budget advisor, Jay Darden, believes the economy will eventually rebound to offset the temporary federal boost. Thirteen states sued the Biden administration Wednesday to end a suspension of new oil and gas leases on federal land and water and reschedule canceled sales of leases in the Gulf of Mexico, Alaska waters, and western states. State Attorney General Jeff Landry is leading the Republican-leaning states. He is seeking a court order to end the moratorium imposed by President Biden when he signed those executive orders on climate change. Republican Julia Letlow easily won last Saturday's special election for the seat in the U.S. House that her husband Luke couldn't fill because of his death from COVID-19 complications. With the victory, she becomes the third woman ever elected to the U.S. House from Louisiana the first Republican woman elected to Congress from the state, and the only woman among its current congressional delegation. There is a runoff between Democratic New Orleans state senators Troy Carter and Karen Carter-Peterson. Field work that goes into the long-awaited University Lakes Project in Baton Rouge is set to begin next week. Phase one begins with a lot of geotechnical borings and sediment samplings. Recommendations to bring the lakes back to life are from a 2016 master plan. Also in the news, we know there's a major renovation going on at the Superdome that's expected to be ready this fall. Well, there's going to be something else new that you will see when you uh, head to the Dome. Caesars Entertainment is expected to put its name on the Dome as it signs a deal to take over naming rights. Of course, none of that is set in stone. You could expect those changes this summer.
The sexual misconduct saga at LSU claimed another victim this week. Oregon State President F. King Alexander resigned after the Board of Trustees there told him he had no choice and there was no trust in him. King and former coach Les Miles are now both out of their jobs as part of their part in the LSU scandal. LSU serious failures were no surprise to the Baton Rouge nonprofit Star, which counsels and consoles sexual trauma victims. Tonight, in part two of my interview with Star CEO Rachel Abair and staff attorney Arizona Cleves, what might come next as voices long silenced are now being heard. Star. The Sexual Trauma Awareness and Response Organization. We've been in existence as STAR since 2012. Our roots date back to 1975. We actually started as part of the East Baton Rouge District Attorney's Office. This feels like a new day, though, to you? Oh, absolutely. You know, we've been really pushing for change uh, really since, you know, we started in 2012. And just to go back to your previous question about is Louisiana so different, Louisiana is one of the only states in the country that doesn't have sexual assault specific funding for centers like STAR. And in a state as large as Louisiana, which with as many problems with sexual assault and domestic violence, there are only 11 service providers in the state. And so, you know, looking at where resources are, they're just not there. And so when people need support from places like STAR or other centers or domestic violence shelters, there is very limited services. Will it always remain difficult for victims to speak out or do you think it's less so now? I think the culture is getting better. And as Arizona mentioned, we have campaigns like Start by Believing, but of course we have a, a culture that normalizes sexual violence. Jameis Winston is now gonna be the quarterback for the Saints. Jameis Winston has a very long track record of sexual assault dating back to his time at Florida State. And so, no, I don't think that there's a lot of change happening. Um, I think that we have a lot of blind spots. We need to do much more work and we really need to put resources towards this issue. Is there discussion about you guys being funded uh, in a way that you're not uh, by universities? Well, we certainly are looking to universities to do contracts with STAR specifically in the area of looking at what their training requirements are for staff, improving their training, and looking at what students are being informed about and making sure that they know the process. But of course, universities, specifically state-funded universities, are getting their funding from the legislature, which has continued to cut higher ed funds. As I mentioned already, sexual assault services are not state-funded. And so I think it really is up to the state legislature to put more resources toward both universities to solve this issue and sexual assault centers like STAR. With uh, the next session coming up, um, Arizola, is that something that you will do? And you, Rachel, will you both speak at the legislature about this topic? Generally, our legal director really leads legislation um, for our organization, and she does an excellent job. In the there's times where you know we may go as staff attorneys, but generally my work is with survivors. We're gonna try. <laughs> you know, it's a fiscal session. Um, many legislators already have their bills, and of course there is this continued question of where would the money come from. You know, um, it, it's it's a constant struggle to get the state budget to give any social services funding. There's a little momentum right now because the spotlight's on. Uh, but what would be next? What we're hoping is next is that, of course, we know that with this high publicity, there's going to be more survivors. And so we expect that star that more survivors, survivors will come to us for services and we'll continue to provide those free and confidential services. And we continue to have conversations at the university level with administrators. I spoke at the UL conference uh, discussing sexual assault on college campuses. And we will continue to work with universities to hold them accountable as well as help them figure this out. And at the Capitol today, a Senate hearing listened to more about the sexual abuse allegations. LSU's athletic director, Scott Woodward, and some of the LSU board members were there.
Louisiana is now home to the city with the most robocalls per person, and that is Baton Rouge, Louisiana. As of March 2021, the capital city surpassed the average number of robocalls, coming in at more than 30 calls per person a month. Carmen Millian, the president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau in South Central Louisiana, says the rise has been happening for some time now, and that trend is continuing upward. When the phone rings anywhere in Louisiana, there's a risk. You don't know who's on the other side. It could actually be someone you know, or it could be this. Within 24 hours, due to suspicious and fraudulent activities found on your social, we regret to inform you that this case is critical and time sensitive. These types of messages are rampant in the South, but recently, Louisiana is at the top of that list. Baton Rouge, especially, is um, pretty high on um, the number of robocalls that the consumers um, receive in our area. An average uh, around the United States is 13 to 14 per day. And unfortunately, uh, the residents and businesses of Baton Rouge are currently this month receiving uh, almost 39 per person. And um, that's, that's, that's pretty staggering numbers. Carmen Million is the president of, and CEO of the Better Business Bureau in South Central Louisiana. She tracks scammers and sketchy phone calls for a living. She says the rise in robocalls has really been on an upward tick for a couple of years now. Just before the pandemic in January 2020, Baton Rouge, Louisiana was ranked in the top five for highest number of calls per person. It held its spot until recently. Baton Rouge is being hit pretty hard, especially in the month of February you know, which is actually the shortest month of the year, but we were hit with the most calls. As of March 2021, Baton Rouge, Louisiana is ranked the robocall capital in the United States. Experts say it comes down to a couple of things. It has a large vulnerable population, which usually means elderly people. Elderly were targets because they were at home and they were available. Well, and especially since COVID hit, more people working from, from home and they're, they're attached to their phones. We all know that. And of course, the age group is, is lowering. And the South also has something called hospitality, which makes them more likely to answer the phone, especially if the number is coming from an area code similar to their own. Robocall or scammers, um, depending on you know, what they're doing, um, are going to target people who are most available. And apparently, we just happen to be um, you know, available to um, to be contacted. And robocalls are basically those calls that you get that um, your phone rings and uh, you pick it up and um, there's an automated uh, caller on the other line. In some cases, what we tell people is if you let the phone ring long enough and you pick it up and there's a hang up, that's usually a robocaller also. There are ways to spot a robocaller. First, you should always look at the number. If it doesn't have an area code and says something like United States or unknown caller, it's best not to answer it. If it leaves you a voicemail, listen to it. If it sounds something like this one, If you do not want to get arrested, press 1 to speak to the officer. It's safe to say that it isn't legitimate. The way things are going now with technology, they can hide where the call is coming from. So in some cases, it's very hard to determine where that robocall is coming from. And in some cases, they can block the number that they're calling from and put another number that looks like it's local. Sometimes scammers will use grammatically incorrect language. And most likely, it'll be a general message that asks for very personal information, like social security numbers and bank account info. They know how to make it, it seem real and legitimate, and you just need to be cautious. If you get calls for phone numbers you don't recognize, you can contact the Better Business Bureau to check it out for you. Billion says it's always better to be safe than sorry. Well, Baton Rouge has long been proud and fortunate to have tap water that is pure and clean. But is that water, which also serves the northern 10 parishes of southeastern Louisiana, at risk because of overuse from industry? That's the finding of a report just released earlier this month. It's a report, though, that not everybody is buying. 
This latest report says statewide groundwater levels are falling faster than most of the country, and the Southern Hills Aquifer is especially at risk. An analysis of groundwater data by the Investigative Reporting Workshop and WWNO-WRKF shows it's losing water faster than any other aquifer in the state, more than 50 feet in the last 50 years. First off, uh, he's been involved a lot longer than me, <laughs> way before I showed up on the scene. That when I got None of that is news to two of the biggest voices for Save Our Water Baton Rouge. State Representative C. Denise Marcel and retired contractor Hayes Town Jr. Mayor Sharon Weston Broom herself appointed Town to the Capital Area Groundwater Conservation Commission. Running right through the middle of Baton Rouge is a fault line that separates fresh water on the northern side from salt water to the south. The intrusion of salt water because of a fault line that runs through Baton Rouge, as this Save Our Water commercial says, is what worries them the most. How Town got involved happened through a series of events after he retired. Yeah, I went back to LSU and just took some courses, audited some courses, and the professors in geography and climatology said, why don't you sign up and get credit for it? So I did, and they helped me through it to get a master's degree in climatology. It's also where he learned something that shocked him, and he wrote his master's thesis on it. I went out to USGS, first thing I did, to start my paper. And uh, they were very nice and went over everything with me. And I, I looked at the way the salt water was encroaching on our drinking water. So I got one of them aside and I said, this doesn't count, but is this gonna last forever? He said, no, it's not gonna last forever. And they knew that we had a limited life on the fresh water, but they wouldn't talk about it because it's unpopular. So I started talking about it. His talking eventually led him to the sprawling plant in North Baton Rouge. A number of years ago, I got some people and went to visit the plant manager of Exxon. I had two city councilmen and some other people with me. And we asked them to get off the water. And we thought they were nice as they could be, as you'd imagine they would be. He says, Hayes, I don't believe we want to give up that economic advantage right now. In the statement provided, ExxonMobil says, we support and will continue to support sound science, technology, and data from the USGS, Water Institute of the Gulf, and LSU. The company says it currently uses about 50% of water for its operation from the Mississippi River and 50% from the Southern Hills Aquifer. ExxonMobil adds, as of today, there is insufficient evidence to support industry stopping use of groundwater. Why would we wait until we have a crisis to talk about this? Why would we wait, wait until we have a crisis to address this? In 2019, LSU professor and state geological survey member Douglas Carlson said media coverage of the Southern Hills Aquifer had overstated the drinking water problem. Carlson is a groundwater research specialist and says the risk is gradual. Each year at the Capitol, Marcel has introduced legislation and each year it has died with little fanfare. Initially, I was shut completely down at the committee level. Um, the industry knows everybody on the committee. They fill the rooms, the committee rooms, and uh, pretty much shut it down before, I mean, anything that I would say. The Groundwater Commission is in place to oversee, conserve groundwater, and implement management strategies. But in its 45 years, the board often leaned heavily to industry. Last June, during a committee meeting, the part-time executive director quit on the spot. 2020 also saw five commissioners charged with ethics violations for conflicts of interest. But former legislator and engineer Gary Beard took over as commissioner last fall, and many feel it signaled a new day for the commission. He has since gone to the Water Institute of the Gulf for guidance in developing a long-range water management plan an incredible aquifer and it's an incredible resource um, and that there is a saltwater intrusion issue. Allison Dossman is senior vice president and chief scientist at the Water Institute. With a phase one plan behind them, she will spearhead a phase two strategic plan. This is part of the process in taking the, all the science, the data, the information that they've collected, um, that any of the partners have collected, the USGS has collected, LSU has collected, pull that into one place or location. All of us working together 
to develop a plan that has engagement from the public and stakeholders, which is part of our planning effort, as well as engagement from all, all of the partners who utilize the water so that we can develop a long-term strategic plan that whatever transitions or alternatives are moved forward with or decided conserves the aquifer, helps it be sustainable over the long term, but is also built on consensus. At the end of the day, uh, they don't have to work on me for support. They need to work on those legislators uh, for support. And I will certainly uh, give my support, whether it's uh, via uh, a letter or uh, testimony. I'm certainly open to doing that. You know, with all the partners involved, all the data, phase B of that strategic plan from the Water Institute is expected to be ready in three years. The beginning of the coronavirus outbreak was a nightmare for the entire world, but for Asian people, it opened the door for outward discrimination. Hate crimes against Asian Americans steadily climbed after the, after the pandemic reached the United States. Now the country is grappling with a new call for justice and equality. I spoke with Louisiana activists and artists to talk about the implications of these crimes. The surveillance video is simply chilling. A suspected gunman walks into Young's Asian Massage, the first stop on his deadly rampage. Amy Tian Nguyen watched this story unfold in disgust. Later, the chaotic aftermath, police rushing to the door, others watching in disbelief. She lives 470 miles away from Atlanta, where the spa shooting took place. But from her home in New Orleans, she's never felt more attached to a tragedy. I was like horrified because like I was talking about earlier, my family also has salon business and I've grown up, I've grown up there, I've seen it grow and when I, when I heard about that news, I just imagined um, if one day I went to work and um, I would see like my mom, my aunts, my cousins who worked there, their, their lives being like taken away because someone just happened to have a bad day um, is really scary. And to see a place that I've grown up in, see grow, see it just like, sort of stained with someone's um, misguided hate and um, arrogance is really frightening. When Wynn looks at what at one point was being investigated as a hate crime in Atlanta, she sees discrimination coming to the forefront, one that's been years in the making. But things like COVID-19 and isolation have brought out a frustration in people that she says is being wrongly directed at Asian Americans. I feel like there is a lot of misdirected sort of hate and blame being put on the Asian community within the U.S. I feel that, um, I guess, I guess it feels good to be able to put your blame onto something or to sort of um, direct your like frustrations, your anxiety towards something. And um, since coronavirus, it, um, there started to begin Kate begin getting cases within China, people are like, okay, well then that's like the Chinese virus, the Asian people are to blame for this. Violence against Asians has been on the rise in America since the early months of the pandemic. In New York, the number of hate crimes against Asian Americans soared about 800%. The trend is still rising. Even though there haven't been any reports in Louisiana about this type of targeted violence, Wen says it's still unnerving to watch it unravel in other states. She's taken her stress about these crimes and put them into action. I created this fa kitty sticker to raise funds for Asian American Pacific Islander Women Lead. And she uses her art to bring awareness and donate money to social justice organizations that need them. Meanwhile, other people are getting Louisiana's attention in other ways. My name is Van Lee. I am uh, one of the original founders of We the People. Joining me today is Alyssa Fife and Grace Rambo. Van Lee is an activist in New Orleans. He founded the organization We the People to help after George Floyd died. It was a way to bring in justice and resources to the forefront. Now his organization is serving another purpose. It spreads information about the growing anti-Asian hate crimes and addresses how Asians fit into the American fabric. Here's a clip of one of the organization's live discussions. That we 
condemn racial violence and injustice and and want to provide a platform for marginalized communities to have a voice. Anti-Asian racism has always been ex in existence all throughout American history, much like you know black racism and um, also you know hate crimes for other communities, uh, uh, Muslim communities, Jewish communities, things like that. Um, now to be in sort of like the epicenter of that um, gives us an opportunity to really verbalize all of those things. And it's, it's really time to educate uh, a lot of people as to you know, what, what we've been going through, especially with the, the treatment that we've seen to Asian Americans due to the coronavirus. Um, so I think it's kind of like how we were feeling during the Black Lives Matter you know, movement last year. It was sort of like, we're going to use this opportunity to to help uh, organize, agitate, and educate. Lee says the spike in hate crimes is forcing people in Louisiana to talk about the community in a way that even some Asians were uncomfortable talking about. Now, it's time for people to do something. Now it's just a matter of what, what actions can we implement that are going to change the way we think about um, Asian culture, change the way we think about Black culture, Latino culture in the future so that we can actually build an America that we want. Authorities say that there isn't enough evidence to charge that Atlanta spa shooter with federal hate crime charges, but both Lee and Wynn say this rise in crime against Asian Americans is still worth the conversation. Yeah, boy, is it ever. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB app. You can catch LPB News and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.